The Lord be with you. I'm Todd Townsend, Bishop of Huron. As I mentioned two weeks ago, I hope to stop and briefly take a look at these Genesis stories from the perspective of three women. I can really only borrow the viewpoint of other women as we read these stories, and when I do, uh, there are so many surprises and revelatory moments. In what follows, I'm reading with Wilda Gaffney, a womanist scholar, professor, and Episcopal priest who wrote this book, Womanist Midrash. Um, I also recommend her website, willgaffney.com. And with Will's help, we'll go back and notice some things about uh, Eve, Sarah, and Hagar and maybe other people in the scriptures. Eve. In Genesis 2.18, it says in Will's translation, it is not good that the Adam, the human, is alone. I will make a mighty helper correlating to it. Most interpretations of this part of the story imply that Adam was a man who needed a helper, so God put him to sleep and made Eve out of his rib. And that is partly right. It's probably more accurate, though, to hear the words the Adam at this point as the human, the one who came from the red-brown earth, the humus. The word often means all of humanity. And the word for mighty helper usually refers in the Bible to God, the divine help that comes. And in English, there's this sense of a lower status of one being helped. But that's not the case here. The physical source material of this human mighty helper is comes from within the earth the earthling itself god puts the creature to sleep and divides it in half god splits the earth colored adam into two equal portions and gaffney says it's like something like mitosis in cell division and that makes sense to me and it's already beginning to reshape my imagination even as it reveals the deeper truth in the story and only at this point are the two referred to as male and female. So Eve becomes the first woman. If we read with care, the actual words of the story will adjust some of our assumptions about what this narrative implies, regarding especially the relationship between the first woman and the first man. The story goes on to the setting of the Garden of Eden, and I won't go over that ground again. But outside of Eden, we see that Eve is not only the first woman, she is the first mother. Her name itself implies that she is the mother of all living. She's the first one to know the joys and sorrows of being a mother. And part of the sorrow is that she's the first mother of death too, in, in the son of her de death of her son Abel. And we see this figure whose story has only been partly told. She's a woman and a mother, but first she's a partner and a mighty helper in the manner of God. And there's a mutuality of belonging and empowerment in her relationship with the other human. It is remarkable to see also how God provides for Eve and blesses Eve and notices Eve and does not subordinate Eve. God sows for Eve and clothes her, restores to her, to her, the woman, when her oldest is banished and her youngest is dead. And she provides a family for the earth. Sarah. Perhaps Sarah is not the most famous woman in the Bible, but Sarah, formerly Sarah, is certainly the most mentioned, far more times than any other woman. 55 times in the First Testament and four in the New Testament. She's an important woman. In Genesis 12, we're first introduced to her, and the word most associated with her is barren, infertile. This is an agricultural term that implies that her soil is inhospitable to life, or at least it seems to be. We also learn that she's 65 years old and very beautiful. In fact, when Abraham, formerly Abram, and Sarah begin to follow God's call and travel across the lands, Abraham's at great risk because of her beauty. He fears that the powerful men that they encounter will desire her and kill him off because he's her husband. So here we have a 65-year-old woman who is so exceedingly, maddeningly beautiful that she draws the covetous attentions of foreign monarchs, which is exactly what happened. And Abraham, fearing for his life, pretends that it's her, she's her sis, his sister. And the Egyptian pharaoh um, takes Sarah as his wife, gives all kinds of benefits to Abraham as a thank offering, I guess. 
And so basically Abraham pimps her out and benefits from it. But once the Pharaoh realizes the truth, he wants nothing to do with it and releases her and the two of them carry on rich. Sarah carries on rich, beautiful, and now the victim of sexual violence. She also continues childless or futureless in that world. In chapter 16, we see that Sarah then turns to surrogacy, giving her servant girl Hagar to Abraham as a wife so that she may become a mother. She takes things into her own hands by handing over another woman to be her body, providing a child, Ishmael. Then later, laughing at God's promises to make her the mother of a whole nation, she conceives and bears a child herself, Isaac. So both of these women become mothers of nations. Both of them come through painful and abusive situations. Both of them are favored by God, not just because they were given children, but because they were loved by the God who promised them something and provided it in surprising and strange ways. But it's so realistic, partly because it's painful the way it's woven into the story. So very real. Sarah finally is presented in the text as the fully rounded human being, fascinating, complex. She's given her own promise from God and she becomes the mother of faith. Eve and Sarah. I told you we'd take a look at Hagar as well, and we will, but there's a lot to that story, and I'm going to run out of time this week, so next week we'll do that, and I'll also extend a bit further to see what Rebecca brings into the story as we continue through Genesis. Until then, peace be with you, and I just wanted to take this opportunity to note that on July 20th, we released the Diocese of Huron's Loving Our Neighbors Amber Stage Guidelines. We're st still currently in the Red Stage now in August, but um, these are provided so that congregations can get ready for what we will hope will take effect in September. So these details are provided on the Diocese of Huron website, and if all goes well, our first Sunday indoor services will be September 13th. Should the pandemic worsen, of course, we may have to change that date. In the meantime, stay safe, keep distance, be kind, and pray for the healing of the world.